to everyone, and thank you for joining us. Now, welcome to this presentation, which is part of an ongoing Goose webinar series uh, around issues and projects associated with global sustained ocean observing. My name is Albert Fisher. I'm the director of the Global Ocean Observing System Program Office, which is headquartered here at the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO in Paris. And for the next hour, we'll start with an about 30-minute presentation from David Ibura. Uh, David is Director of Coastal Oceans Research and Development Indian Ocean, Cordio, East Africa, which is based in Mombasa in Kenya. And he's also leading the charge to strengthen the Global Coral Reef Monitoring Network, or GCRMN, which is an operational network of the International Coral Reef Initiative. Uh, Goose's Biology and Ecosystems Panel, of which David is a member, has identified live coral as one of the essential ocean variables, one where readiness of the of the specification and capacity to observe are in a pilot stage beyond just the conceptual stage. So that makes the strengthening of uh, GCRMN of great interest to Goose. After David's uh, presentation, we'll conduct a question and answer session by chat. Um, I'll moderate and select the questions and ask them verbally. Chat window is open already, uh, and I see people are introducing themselves, which is great. So if you'd like to start asking clarifying questions during the presentation, please go ahead. We're recording the session, and we'll post the session on the Goose website after the seminar. So, David, over to you for your presentation. Okay, thanks very much, Albert. I hope um, everyone can hear me clearly enough. Um, we do have a crow in the background, so I think there's a bit of background noise. Hopefully, we won't get too much. Um, so, thanks for joining. Nice to see a few familiar names in the crowd. See you. Um, and so, yes, as Albert has introduced, I'm based in Mombasa working for Cordio East Africa, we're a non profit research organization working on coral reefs. Um, I also am doing this very much as the chair of the IUCN Coral Specialist Group in terms of trying to identify where we can contribute. David, I'm going to interrupt a moment so because actually I think that we're now a the topic bit too of close to your mouth. My presentation. So if you actually could just leave the microphone in a lower position, it might work. Okay. I hold it a bit further away. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks for letting me know. Um, so the topic is strengthening the global quarry for monitoring and reporting to meet global conservation development needs. And now many of us have worked with the Global Quarry for Monitoring Network over the years. I've certainly been engaged with it since it started back in the, around 1995, 1996, and really saw an opportunity and a need for revamping it and strengthening it and many different um, threads coming together uh, to make this possible. So what I'm going to present to you is an overview of, of how I thought this could move forward. And I've uh, been talking about this quite a bit for the last year and a half or two years almost with various groups. Um, it's not yet fully in motion, still needs to be decided on, and I'll get to that in, in the last slide. But this does involve many different uh, inputs, uh, some of which you'll see the logos and some of you have been involved already. So the outline of my talk, um, why monitor coral reefs, and I'll just touch on slides on societal goals and status of reefs and the status of coral reef monitoring and data. Uh, not to go into any detail, because I think you probably all um, know quite a bit about that. But then I'll spend more time on the where to part, uh, how to move forward, which institutions or organizations could, could play a role, um, the overall plan itself, and then the areas in which uh, technical strengthening can occur um, for the GCRMN, including with data structures and support at the end. And then a final slide on some immediate next steps, which of course, I'm hoping um, we'll have some discussion about and questions and, and opinions from uh, from the participants. So, coral reefs have a high priority societally. They're very up high in the uh, Convention on Biological Diversity HE targets. Um, they're also uh, a key ecosystem uh, for delivering on the sustainable development goals, uh, not just for goal 14 on oceans, but of course, recognizing the various different ways in which coral reefs support uh, people in terms of fisheries, so sustainable production and consumption, their climate vulnerability, uh, and so on. And then the United Nations Environment Assembly um, made a coral reef resolution at its uh, assembly last year, uh, also mentioning 
uh, the International Core Reef Initiative and Global Core Reef Monitoring Network in its role. So this is a this is a network that is at the highest level of international recognition in terms of the role it plays for countries um, and therefore also for society. And I think this is of critical importance in establishing an institutional framework for the monitoring networks. And some of the guidance that I'll talk about, which comes from uh, expert groups, really emphasize the importance of the institutional nature of the monitoring network, not just uh, you know, a, a club of willing scientists and so on gathering a lot of data, but why is it done and for whose benefit and who can give direction and, and credence to, uh, to the results that come out in terms of uh, value to society. So I think this is very important. Um, and uh, the status of coral reefs, of course, we, we know that they are highly threatened. Um, I won't go into the points on the left-hand side. This is more for the record. But also recognizing that the threats to coral reefs, the current and future drivers, this is the uh, subject of HE Target 10, they're all increasing. And as long as population size continues to grow, as long as economic activity grows the way it is now, these threats will continue to rise. There's no way of bringing them down. Uh, so we do really need to, to pay attention to, um, to their impact on coral reefs and how to use coral reefs also as a messaging tool to, to push for change. Now, when I started this process, I drew this little schematic of the way we are tending to do coral reef monitoring now, um, or we gather data at the source in coral reef regions. And the GCRMN uh, in the bottom row was doing reporting at national, regional, and global levels. Um, and this would feed through into various uh, global assessments or into the global biodiversity outlook, for example, for the CBD. But this was completely separated from the other stream that needs to use the data, which is more around decision support, such as IUCN red listing, um, identifying priority areas, and conservation planning. So we were having a two-track approach. And this uh, was not optimal, uh, clearly. And I think in moving forward, um, the OK, I'm not sure my animations are working, so this may take a little bit of clicking to get through. OK, so in moving forward, I thought that we need to move to a different model of collecting and reporting the data, which is much less of a traditional approach and more of a pipeline approach, where from the primary data that we collect in the GCRM and backbone, we do push that data into decision support and into reporting at various levels. Um, but these streams are not separated. And they're joined first by using intermediate variables uh, to produce these final products. And this is the role of the essential biodiversity and essential ocean variables, which I'll get to in a moment. But then also, once you get to the societal needs um, for uh, collecting and reporting on this data, there's also uh, merging that happens there from local levels all the way up to global levels. Um, and it's uh, critical to use the same or to use a common data and reporting framework that supports all of these. One, so that uh, we maximize the benefits obtained from spending money on monitoring for multiple different purposes. But then also there's consistency in the outputs and the outcomes from that data. So you don't have conflicting results that uh, might be valid in many cases because we measure different things in different places. But they can just confuse the process in terms of getting uh, commitment and action on the ground. And in terms of thinking about the monitoring teams uh, and the scientists and the people who provide the data, um, we need to go into this aspect of, uh, of at what point do we try and open data up as much as possible to feed all these societal benefits. Because the more we open the data, the more benefit we'll get from it. And that's a critical discussion that needs to take place. Uh, and through monitoring and observing systems um, and the networks that support them, we have an opportunity to do that. So then moving into um, the plan for moving forward, it's, it's a who's who of different organizations. Um, of course, I've, we've already introduced the um, ICRI and GCRM at the top uh, as the main client in a way, and I'll get into that. And then I'll go through the ones further down the list uh, as I move through the talk. Now, the International Coral Reef Initiative, it started in 1994, initially uh, promoted and started under the UNESCO IOC um, with a meeting in the Philippines. Um, 
And it's been running ever since then. Um, we're in the 11th Secretariat. The Secretariat tends to rotate between two countries in general now, held for two years. But at the moment, France is, is hosting the Secretariat. Um, and its membership comprises uh, 26 countries at the moment. Um, I think this is up to date for countries uh, listed there. And then a range of other entities, um, organizations, um, but also, for example, UNEP, United Nations Environment Program, the CBD Secretariat. So a very broad uh, membership that state and non-state actors provides a framework for coming together that is quite unusual um, and yet has access to the, the UN systems in terms of uh, priorities and decision and uh, trying to influence decisions. Now, the Global Coral Reef Monitoring Network is an operational network of ICRI, so a technical network uh, that's fully owned or under the ICRI umbrella. Um, and it started in 95, 96. The motivation was beginning to happen for it. And the big bleaching event in 97, 98 globally really gave the impetus for the GCRMN to, to really take off under the leadership of Clive Wilkinson. Now, since then, of course, it's difficult to sustain monitoring year on year for, for 20 years now, 23 years. Um, and so uh, its management has gone up and down. It's had different models with a global coordinator, uh, very much focusing on regional to sub-regional node structure, which still persists today. And the monitoring teams and the countries and the networks that have formed some of those nodes are still very active. And you feel a lot of ownership of GCRM in their regions. And then it's also had a management group uh, under, under ICRI. Um, now I'll come back to institutional structure in a moment uh, when I come to um, how we uh, its next steps. I also want to mention here, but just in passing, the International Society for Reef Studies and its uh, Cori Symposia every four years, because I think it's a critical in the next steps that the scientific community around coral reefs takes full full ownership and becomes fully involved in the strengthening and the processes of the GCRMN. Because in, in essence, it's the responsibility of our, core, uh, of our science community to contribute the information to the societal processes and the decisions that need to be made around coral reefs um, in the future. Now, under this umbrella, um, I've been working through a, a five or a five-year work plan from 2016 to 2020. 2016 was really focused on motivating for a strengthened process in coral reef monitoring and reporting. And then 2017 to 2020 uh, will be described uh, shortly. And this is really to upgrade the GCRMN standards. Uh, so to bring it uh, not back up to scratch, it, it was stronger before and it's, it's a bit weaker now, but really to make it a much uh, a modern observing network and to use uh, practices developed by other, uh, other networks uh, that I'll get to in a moment. And really so that the, the data from GCRMN it used to be used in reporting at regional and global levels uh, in a report, but we really want to make it a data-driven process and so that these data becomes um, used in, in numerous reporting processes um, and becomes openly available. And 2020 is the target date because the CORIFs are very important in HE Target 10, and then of course thereafter into SDG 14 and the SDG processes. So 2016 was uh, a lot of meetings. Uh, I didn't attend all of them. Others uh, were at some of them and presented the strengthening program, starting with a Goose Biology and Ecosystems Panel meeting in February, moving through a, a workshop at CBD Substar, then at the International Coral Reef Symposium, Geobon, IUCN World Conservation Congress, and then again under the Goose uh, Biology and Ecosystems Panel. And then a final endorsement through the ICRI general meeting in November last year, um, in which a decision to move, move ahead was, uh, was, was made. And I'll come back to that. So coming to the technical strengthening uh, and the roles of these various entities. So <clears throat> focusing now in, on these three in the middle, I think the Geobon, Goose, and the OBIS in particular have a lot to offer in this case. I've been fortunate or I've been a bit strategic in accepting invitations onto both Geobon and Goose over the last sort of two to five years because I had a sense that, that there were possibilities here that I wanted to understand more. Um, and really this uh, proposal is an outcome of, of being part of those processes and, and seeing the internal dynamics a bit more. Now in both, so and to use 
best practice established by Dubon and Goose um, from various biodiversity and ocean focal areas to bring to the GCRMN. So we're not reinventing um, good anything from scratch. There's a lot that we can base this on. So two key documents, really. From Goose, it's this framework for ocean observing, which was published by UNESCO in 2012. And Geobon has had some guidance, and has, that's been pulled into um, this concept note uh, for a nine-step process for developing biodiversity observation networks. And that's being formalized um, now in, as Geobon is reorganizing itself. So now what I'll do in the presentation is just go through the various elements um, that have identified through these processes that I think we can start to implement for the GCRMN. <coughs> Excuse me. So first, looking at um, both Goose and Geobon, this concept of essential variables. Now these have come through the climate community um, and the need for, under the IPCC to um, identify the, the most stable variables for the global community to be measuring in a concerted fashion to, to feed into the global reporting process. And Goose has taken this through, um, uh, through geochemistry as well, and now into uh, biology and ecosystems. Now, under the Goose guidance, essential variables need to have high relevance, feasibility, and cost effectiveness. Um, and the impact and the feasibility are uh, uh, shown in, that, in the schematic graph there, where we need to identify um, variables that have both high feasibility and high impact relevance and we they're cost effective in terms of measuring them and collecting them from all over the globe it's not much use if you can only collect it in a few places it has to be um, very widespread over the last few years there has been a process um, to solidify this essential ocean variable concept um, there are three panels uh, under goose the physics and biochemistry uh, have been established for longer time and if you go to the web link uh, showing up above, you can see this table, which uh, can, which gives out the specification sheets on each of the essential variables that have been identified under the different panels. Now, the biology and ecosystems panel, um, which uh, Frank uh, is on as well with me uh, on this call, um, we have been going through a process of uh, prioritizing the, the top. There were 10 variables that were closest to uh, that we thought to being ready to be an essential variable, but really the top two in terms of readiness are live coral, um, the arrow pointing to it, and then also zooplankton, biomass, and diversity. And now I think the, the main point here is that uh, the GCRMN has been working on uh, live coral as one of its main variables for many years. Uh, and the science community, of course, is working on this independently. But it's really, this is, this is, um, synergy or coherence coming from different directions, converging on the same uh, few variables as being the most important. And I think that's, that's really the value we should take from um, the complementarity that we can get or how we can get, uh, for example, this Goose guidance to really strengthen the GCRMN rather than to start up uh, something else. Now, if you click on Live Coral, you get to a draft uh, spec sheet for it. It's about six pages now, uh, and I've been developing it and with review within the panel, and we're getting review. Uh, we've had some review outside of the panel as well. And each of the variables is defined uh, quite stringently in these spec sheets. And this is to give monitoring programs guidance on what the final variable should be, um, whereas they can have control on how they measure it. And of course, they need to justify uh, the, the reliability of, of, the, of the measuring system. So this is a bit different from the start of GCRMN where we focused on methodology. And now I think along with uh, other programs, there's a clear sense we need to focus on the information content that comes out um, and have a bit more uh, degrees of freedom uh, with methodologies because they're also changing so much. Now Geobon, this is the Geobiodiversity Observation Network, um, has gone through a similar process defining essential biodiversity variables. And their approach is, is, is quite different from the, the directions that Goose has taken in developing them. But there's complementarities and there's a lot of use for both, I think, in coral reefs, because coral reefs sit between the ocean and the biodiversity communities very strongly. Um, in the middle here, in the blue circle that I've put, um, 
the GeoBond has really identified six classes of essential biodiversity variables that can be produced from primary data that is collected in the field or from remote sensing. And that it's upon monitoring programs uh, and networks to identify and what are the key EBVs that can be generated from a particular science or around a particular ecosystem or group of species. At the moment in the GCRMN, what we collect really focuses on benthic cover and fish and mobile invertebrates. So they're really all just in one of the six classes, this ecosystem extent and structure in the middle. And in moving forward, uh, this will be a bit the longer term plan for GCRM, and it's not the first priority. But it's looking at these six EBV classes and live coral cover, the EOV that has been defined under the GOOSE uh, system. We have one EBV in one class, and over the next uh, five to six years, uh, can the science community identify a whole range more uh, EBVs for coral reefs that cut across all of the six classes? Because one of the big frustrations we have is that in describing coral reefs, we're painfully aware of the limitation of just talking in terms of coral cover, as opposed to community composition, size classes, herbivory, uh, functional processes like that. So this is an area that the scientific community can contribute greatly in the GCRM and strengthening over time. Um, the second area of guidance that is very strong, this is from the framework for ocean observing, is about the readiness of an observing system. And the idea that there are three levels of readiness, um, with, the most, with the strongest being the mature level. So where a monitoring program or collection of a variable is spatially and temporarily, consoli temporarily consolidated, um, and that data and products are available and uh, address societal benefits. And the step below this is a pilot phase where we're still in the testing phase for some of these variables. Maybe they're being collected in a few regions, but not globally. Maybe the data products haven't been firmed up yet, uh, but we pretty much know the methodologies and we understand what the variable is, is relating to. And then at the concept stage, the first stage is the idea and bringing in uh, new science, technology, data management tools and trying to, uh, to start a process where there hasn't been one. Um, and there's also value in um, splitting these three levels up amongst three key areas for a monitoring network. So, and this, um, I've labeled it here as societal objectives. We need to identify uh, why we're doing the monitoring. How well is the need for monitoring expressed in terms of uh, the need for, for people, for conservation, uh, for users and so on. What's the justification? Then the area we've really focused on in the GCRMN, for example, so far has been in the methods and operations. Um, this is the protocols and technical standards, capacity, and so on. Um, and then the third area is around data management and reporting and outputs. And again, uh, as uh, early monitoring systems, uh, we tend not to think about this so much, thinking that people will just use the information once, once you record it. But of course, we have to invest a lot more in this. And each of these three areas, you can have a monitoring and observing network that can pass from concept to pilot to mature stages in, in a level of readiness. And this is very useful in dealing with a complex and a global system such as with coral reefs, where how do you identify where to invest uh, your resources to, to improve uh, the system? So this is a table in the framework for ocean observing, and it, breaks each of those three levels down into three sub-levels. I won't go into those in detail here. But the benefit is that you can identify where a program starts. And then from that, you can identify quite, um, quite precisely what interventions you need to do to move it up the readiness scale until it becomes mature for, for all levels, the, the requirements, the societal objectives for the program, the actual monitoring. Uh, methods and operations, and then also data management information products. Now, in developing the, uh, coral, uh, the coral cover specification sheet, we received some feedback from some monitoring programs. And these are basically self-assigned readiness levels that, that were reported back to us uh, from some of the coordinators. So we've got the global level for GCRMN, I uh, estimated that basically of the Caribbean, the West Indian Ocean, the Central Western Pacific, and the Great Barrier Reef. And they've been rated for readiness for their requirements, the observation system, and data information. 
And you can see from this that we feel as a community, at least, that our requirements and justification for monitoring are relatively well established for coral reefs. Readiness of observing systems is quite variable among regions and at different scales. And this has a lot to do with funding capacity and tractability of, of a region of the scale being dealt with. But where we really fall short is the data and information provision to address societal needs is generally quite immature. Um, except in this case, we had the Great Barrier Reef responded on their system. And of course, this is a very coherent and consistent management framework that has thought through uh, the data information needs uh, and why, who they need to report out to. So this is a process that we can go through in the next few years, looking at the different regions that are undertaking um, TCRM and monitoring, and for each region to strengthen components of their process um, and move forward in that way. And then lastly, the last area that's very important, I think, uh, for ad adopting guidance is in the institutional framework for an ocean observing system. Um, and the framework for ocean observing um, advocates three levels of governance. Um, and this is something we haven't had before in the GCRMN, and I, through thinking through it, I think it does make a big difference. The top level is the oversight group, and that's really the political ownership um, of ICRI by the, by the members. So these are countries, uh, the UN system, the CBD are important there, but also representatives from societies and NGOs, and there could be some civil society groups as well. And this is uh, essentially the the board uh, for overseeing the GCRMN. Then under that is a technical steering committee or group, which really needs to do all the work of, of working out how to strengthen uh, the GCRMN, identifying technical standards, capacity building needs, linkages between institutions and other networks and so on. And this is the level at which uh, I hope we can push forward a lot of work in the next few years. And then the third level, the implementation communities, is critical. And this is the regional and the national monitoring structures and observing teams and the regional networks that have persisted from the beginning and until this day and are very committed to the GCRMN as a network and as an institutional structure. I think uh, founding the monitoring through these regional structures has worked for us for coral reefs. And I think we need to, to strengthen that and, and uh, build it up even further. Oh, and then lastly, just touching quickly on, on data management. Now, OBIS, the Ocean Biogeographic Information System, is coming through very strongly in terms of offering support. Uh, we don't have a data base for coral reefs globally. There have been smaller ones that programs have used, or even countries. There has been a, an overall repository for information, but not a functioning database. Um, and OBIS has already committed, and the Syrian group has decided to make coral reefs a focal theme for 2017 and the possibility of having a training course for Cori from data managers and scientists and using OBIS to be focused on core reefs. Uh, and my thinking is that this should be integrated with the GCRM and regional reporting processes for this year, which have an Asia-Pacific focus. And of course, there's infrastructure at IOC and these regional training centers um, at which such a course could be based. And this, this shows a kind of uh, institutional commitment um, and support that I think GCRM can really benefit from, where we don't have to have one large grant that supports everything, but you know the, the commitments and the inputs from many different partners that, that will really push it forward. The second area of interest for OBIS is developing a coral reef thematic portal. So providing an interface to primary reef databases that scientists and monitoring programs will use and could report from their databases to OBIS. The ecological data that we report in the GCRMN, and this could be complemented by the species data that is already in OBIS and that it was designed around. Um, but it's developing new standards and protocols and has already done that to incorporate ecological data. And the, but the big question here is at what level can we open data? And this is a big question for scientists and monitoring programs and institutions to really debate and discuss, I think, in the context of societal goals. So the, C, the HE targets and the SDGs, how much do we get from holding our data in terms of primary publication in science and how much do coral reefs and society get um, from having it a lot more open a lot earlier? So the next steps, um, second last slide here. So um, I've already explained uh, 2016, 
But where we are now at the beginning of 2017 is we had a decision from the uh, general meeting at ICRI in November to move forward with establishing a steering group to basically decide on the next steps for GCI men and to assign roles and responsibilities and identify uh, where we can look for resources and things like that. So this uh, meeting is in preparation, uh, hopefully to be held in May, uh, and we can move forward at that point. There are, of course, activities moving forward under the various regions that are undertaking their reporting. So we're finishing the West Indian Ocean now. The Caribbean was completed in 2014. The Pacific uh, is underway, and East Asia is in its planning stages, um, and other regions are also in advanced stages of discussions. There's interest in the third international year of the reef in 2018 that the Cree has decided to push that forward as, as a year. So what we do in the GCRMN in 2018 could be very important, particularly in terms of getting trying to get updated monitoring from all regions because the time it'll take to 2020 to compile the data and contribute it into the AT target reporting will probably need the last half of 2019 and, and half of 2020. So that's about the GCRMN itself. And I just wanted to finish the presentation with this looking out more broadly. Now, I've really focused the effort. We need to stabilize and strengthen this institution that is the GCRMN. I think the Goose and Geobon um, have key roles to play in that, and a few other entities and organizations. But then once we get the, we're collecting the data and we have an open database um, and it's there, how do we actually make sure that it's really being used in multiple processes? And this is not so much a discussion for now, I don't think, but in terms of uh, looking to the future, building the, Thank you very uh, much, David. Uh, really appreciate uh, your talk and really appreciate the uh, system in uh, taking, identifying in red list and, and, um, to identify key areas for conservation and management and putting together the GCRM uh, and so let me ask you, uh, let me open the floor to questions from anyone in the audience. Into the uh, into the screen, and um, let me kick things off by by asking a question. Thank you very much, David. So David, you mentioned that there's a lot of um, regional efforts for the GCRMN and um, more than 10 different regional reports. Are the, are the um, global drivers for reef reporting products, the scientific and policy drivers, strong enough to drive collaboration on a global level yeah, and overcome these regional differences? Um, I think that's a basic question, Mike. David, you mentioned there's a lot of um, regional efforts for the GCRMN. Um, yeah, thanks, Albert. Your sound is a little bit up and down, but I think I got all of that. Um, to be honest, yes, I th the, the global drivers for the regions reporting together eventually is very strong. I mean, the GCRMN has done it already. Um, and very much kicked off by the establishment of ICRI first, and then also by um, uh, by the, the global bleaching event in 97, 98. Um, and then we went through 10 years of very consistent global reporting in the regions coming together to do that. Since then, the GCRMN has... So as there was a comment, there, there is quite a lot of feedback. Maybe if you put your headphones back on again. Reporting, partly because of the logistics yeah. and challenges of getting global reporting. Let me ask uh, Linwood's question. Um, how are societal goals and policy uses being incorporated in the group on EVs and EOVs for the GCRMN? So as there was a comment, there is quite a lot of feedback. Maybe if you put your headphones back on again. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, Kyle, I have a question. Um, how are societal goals and policies incorporated uh, on the tradition Okay. <clears throat> Thanks. Is, is the sound a bit better there? Um, <clears throat> well, so, so far, Leonard, we haven't, we haven't defined we haven't defined this process of, of how uh, the goals and policies will be incorporated. We have uh, some background already for the Goose Bio Eco Panel. We already went through a process of looking at priority, uh, sustainable um, uh, societal priorities, thinking about EOVs, essential ocean variables as a whole. 
So one, we propose to use that quite a bit. And then the ICRI has also gone through uh, some uh, you know, policy scoping in terms of conventions. Uh, in David, thanks, thanks for putting your headphones on. I think that will so cut down the on the feedback. General meeting um, in November, the, identified that revised you didn't talk much about the, the techniques. Or how do we actually uh, measure life? Uh, can you uh, say a little bit about that? Goals and policy would, would be useful, and that can provide a, a template for how to move forward with, with the GCR now. Um, okay. The, the techniques. Sure, yes, I can talk about the methods. Uh, to some extent in the GCRMN, we've focused so much on methods over the last 20 years that um, it's, it's almost cut and dried what the primary methods are in terms of in situ monitoring. So the, the, the bread and butter of the Global Quality Monitoring Network is monitoring teams going scuba diving, uh, laying down transects or taking photo quadrats at the bottom and looking at, uh, looking at the proportion, proportion of cover of corals, algae, different uh, benthic cover types. And then also in transects counting uh, fish and some key mobile invertebrates and collect, getting data on their sizes so we can calculate biomass. Um, so that's, the, that's been the standard uh, for GCRMN. Now, there's a lot of new techniques that are on the horizon. Um, and so for benthic cover, for example, there's uh, image techniques, um, not only so that you can collect an image and then analyze it uh, in the lab, as opposed to doing it in the, uh, counting in the water, but also automated image analysis is really becoming very accurate now and can deal with huge volumes of data, of course. Um, and uh, videos for, for fish, for example, people are testing brubs, they're called, uh, baited remote underwater video, uh, to use that as a way of counting fish. Remote sensing and satellites are coming into play now in terms of monitoring um, uh, reef extent and habitat extent and then coral bleaching. Um, and then on the horizon, there's, there's probably five or 10 new technologies that will come to play. So for the GCRMN, this will be complicated, trying to work out how do we maintain continuity in the variables that we're collecting when the techniques are going to change so much. And another really important point that I, I uh, want to belabor endlessly is that a lot of the new techniques are automated. And one of the key things for coral reefs in any natural system is to maintain contact between the managers and the ecosystem. And if we go too far in trying to automate all types of data capture, then we'll reduce the contact the managers and the rangers and the scientists have with going in the water and, and monitoring and measuring variables. So we have to be very... So obviously, uh, shallow water corals are extremely widespread in the tropics. So do we actually have the workforce, do you think, to implement this network uh, globally? And if you have a lot of technology coming in and replacing uh, the work that people do, that connects with what they're supposed to manage. That, uh, that I mean, shallow water corals are so widespread in the tropics. Do we actually have a workforce that's able to implement this coral reef monitoring globally? Uh, sorry, Albert, can you, can you say that again? Shallow water corals are so widespread. In the tropics, do we actually have a workforce to implement globally? Well, like like any, I think like any monitoring network, it really um, depends on you know it's a it's a hierarchical or a, or a, um, a, an upside down tree. So when you get out to all those locations where you have coral reefs, um, increasingly now there are communities or government authorities involved in management. So uh, they can collect data, and many do. You do have uh, dive groups or scientists and university programs in place, so they, they can collect data. So I think effectively in the GCRMN, I would say we do have a near global coverage. Of course, Let me ask uh, Frank Miller Carter's question. Um, you, you mentioned a lot of data types, largely the environmental data types related to the corals. He's mentioned that a lot of these policy products uh, need also socioeconomic data to target. So if there was one product that you would want to see address Aichi targets and the sustainable development goals, what would that look like? What appearance would it have? What interface would it have? How would it be used? How frequently would it be issued? You mentioned a lot of data types, largely the environmental data types related to the corals. 
mentioned that a lot of these policies I get about my goals. What would that look like? What how it used African would be issued? Uh, okay, thanks, Frank. Um, I guess I'm assuming you mean a like a a, a data product or a whether it's a database or a portal that that brings in a lot of uh, different information from different sources as opposed to a product that we use to collect data. Um, I I'm not really a good informatician, so I I don't think I really have the answer to this. Um, but I think it's. It needs to be both simple and complex. I think we need to build in some quite simple push button um, queries so that um, uh, a government officer or a park manager or an interested societal group could, could plug in their area of interest and, and uh, a question that says, how healthy are my corals or something like that. Um, but then at the same time, have some, have some interfaces where much more much more creative exploration of the, of the data could happen. Um, now, I think in terms of dealing with HE targets and SDGs, those, of course, are quite formalized processes. So we'll need to engage with the, um, the, the groups that work on, on the targets and the information that comes into them to try and build that in. And hopefully, if we do it at an early enough stage, we can also influence the process. Um, so David, actually, the sound is much better if you just leave the microphone um, hanging um, rather than holding it in your hand. Now, you talked about the great workforce that's potentially there for so uh, I, I don't monitoring. Have a to that Obviously, one. to motivate things at a national level, there has to be a national interest and national products. And uh, is the capacity that's uh, the capacity development has to be done just not in the observing aspects, but also in the delivery aspects of how do we change this information, use this information for management locally. So can you talk a little bit about what kind of capacity building has been done and is needed in that respect? Um, well, so yes, there needs to be a lot of uh, capacity building on the ground or within countries to, to use to use data, so that, that also creates the, the desire for it and, and the, uh, the demand for it. Um, I think um, at national levels, um, in terms of the areas under protection and the importance of coral reefs, there needs to be more high-level commitments to filling the HE target gap, for example, to 10% of marine protected areas or 10% of coral reef areas uh, effectively managed or effectively protected. So to some extent, at the national level, we need that. But then also down to local governments, uh, municipal councils, and protected area managers that, that um, are making decisions on a daily basis. Uh, I think a, a key thing there is um, often they have not had access to much information, and, and the institutions don't make decisions on the basis of data necessarily. They're, they're made on, on many, many other at least coral reef data, they're made on the basis of many other influences. So building capacity to be able to do that, both in the people and in the institutional structures, uh, needs to happen. And I think a lot is happening uh, through many different programs, whether it's through UN-based capacity building, uh, the national institutions for protected areas um, are investing, I think, more and more now. And then, of course, also from the NGO sector as well. There's a lot more assistance coming. In general, do you find that uh, sharing data is an issue uh, in the global coral reef monitoring uh, network? It needs to be provided with information to use. So if we can set up this uh, open data, this infrastructure that, that can stream data to users, then that will accelerate the capacity building on the ground as well. Do I find that sharing data is an issue in the global coverage monitoring network? Do I find that sharing data is an issue? Um, yes. I mean, I've just uh, led the West Indian Ocean process, and getting data from some groups has been very easy and very open, and getting data from others has, has not succeeded. And I think the key 
thing, one thing we also decided strategically is that we were not asking, we're not basing our reporting on primary data, on transect results that, site, that people collect in the field, but we would collect only the site level mean or standard, and standard deviation if, if provided from a site. So, you know, 17% coral cover from site A and 20% from site B. So we didn't deal with any of the variation down to the, you know, down to the 10 meter scale. Um, so, and that's in order because for science publications, I mean, you need to have that uh, go down to that level. So by presenting just the, using just the higher level averages, we're not uh, treading um, on the space that, that scientists um, necessarily work at in terms of their publications. But I think another big realization we need to get to is that now in the publishing world now, um, and also in terms of information, just a site level mean of coral cover or fish biomass um, isn't what gets you publication or the greatest value for, for, your, for your data sets. You need to have a lot of other information too in terms of the context or you know, cause effects, uh, variables, or experiments and things like that. So I think we're well beyond the stage where just reporting on the average coral cover in a site is you know, sufficient output. Uh, for science and for investment. So getting people to share that at a much earlier stage, I think, um, will be a big... So often in Goose, we think of users um, as being, so uh, one of the users, key users, uh, as being the global scientific community, which is a climate uh, research uh, community. And, and obviously that's one user of the global climate, uh, global coral reef monitoring network as well, is the global coral reef uh, scientist community. At, at a local level, though, you talked about marine protected areas, the involvement of the managers and the rangers. Which sectors are the ones, in your experience, that have the most interest in the coral reefs, whether it's tourism or or fisheries? Um. Well, locally, I would say, well, conservation, so, so management tends to have the greatest interest. So far, I haven't um, heard, you know, really strong interest in data per se from the tourism sector in, in East Africa, for example. I mean, they want to know that reefs are good or want to project that reefs are in good state. But whether that means it's 20% coral cover or 40% coral cover isn't really a discussion that, that happens there. Um, there's a bit more awareness on the fishery side in terms of uh, reefs providing habitat for, for fish. So I think the fisheries managers are getting more interested in, in the ecosystem health um, and then also in spillover and things like that from protected areas. So I think we still have quite a bit to do to, you know, to, to build up the, the need and recognition of the need and the use of, of data that's coming out. But I think that you know, it's a chicken and egg. I think once you can provide information much more readily, and particularly the context, if um, you have a manager who has a, you have a, man, a monitoring team in an MPA, so they have their data. They don't necessarily analyze it or use it very much, but if, so they, but they do essentially know, could know what it says without any help from anybody else. But it's, if they upload their information, they're then able to look at I think that attaches again to um, Frank's question about the complementary data that's needed to interpret the coral reefs or actually manage the coral reefs. Um, can you say something about that, about uh, sort of the land use data and, uh, and the human impact uh, data that's needed to understand the uh, coral data? Yes, well, that's the thing. So in the past, the G sermon reports have been very focused on on the trend data from from reefs, um, and I think the reefs at risk program especially showed the you know the power of, of showing the drivers and the contextual information um, around. Uh, collecting the, the status data. So, um, and in the West Indian Ocean GCRMN report, for example, we have a we have a very short regional chapter with drivers. So, uh, climate um, 
climate trends and projections into the future, population trends, um, and things like that. So, so that kind of uh, information on drivers is, is critical because they are, especially in, well, in, in Africa anyway, they are accelerating so quickly that um, it's almost pointless thinking about managing for the next three or four years if we're not thinking about the drivers and what they mean for 20 years from now. Uh, and I think that's very much the message coming from the climate community as well in terms of looking for the reefs that will uh, withstand uh, the next decades of, of climate change. So on that side, it's important. And then, of course, we're still focusing very much on biological data um, in this initial steps with the GCRMN. The GCRMN has had a socioeconomic monitoring program that started in around 2001 with SOCMON. And that's still been quite uh, active in, in a couple of regions. Um, but it's much more difficult. Well, just as the goose panels have gone from physics to biochemistry to biology, going sort of up, up the ladder of complexity in terms of constraining the variables so that they are reliable. Uh, there's a, a huge additional step to make to get to the socioeconomic data as well. Um, but of course, there's strong interest in that, and we need that for the to put coral reefs in the context of the SDGs. So I'm sure that as we start this process in the next year or two, um, that's the other key thing about the GCRMN process we need to develop is that it's not that the GCRMN core coordination necessarily necessarily does everything. Um, so we have a question from um, Tali Vardy, which is about the observing network itself. How confident are you that the partners collect the data in a manner consistent with the monitoring protocols and will update their, upload their data in a timely manner? Do you partners have the capacity, skills, and equipment necessary? And in addition to that, is, I mean, is there appetite across all the different regional networks under PCRMN to, to adopt some common standards and best practice? Yes, so I would say that there's there's great willingness to do that. I mean, the GCRMN has already gone through this process the last 20 years of agreeing on common methods. Um, and of course, as scientists and technical people, we debate endlessly about the best method and the, the most reliable one and most precise. Um, but the monitoring teams in general, um, with good guidance, especially if you can get in at the design stage in a monitoring program, are very, I found are very happy to, you know, to hear recommendations about what's the best, what's the best way to do it and for what reasons, and then they can make their decisions. So I found that um, there's willingness to collect data in a very consistent manner, and, and, but that's consistent continual effort that we have to invest to, to ensure that. The timeliness depends a lot on funding, um, as well on capacity and skills. Um, so that can be quite up and down. Uh, and but I think I I try to de-emphasize the issue of funding for each season of monitoring, uh, needing money to come in from somewhere, because in many cases you have managers that need to go out to a site, or community members who are going out to fish, for example, or to look after their area, or you have scientists or universities of courses who could collect consistent data on an annual or biannual basis through different programs. So by hook or by crook, it is possible to maintain some sort of data stream over time. And we need to empower groups that don't have consistent funding to start to invest and then to try their best to maintain uh, consistency, um, while at the same time, of course, trying to secure support as much as we can and to really institutionalize. Um, these processes. So I think there's great willingness in the Corrie community to do this. Um, so following up on that comment, uh, let me ask Frank's problem. question. What do you need from Geobon and Bon? How do we advance the goals you presented? And then I can ask the complimentary well, question. What do you need from Goose? Planning monitoring, we are still people. And we have different priorities from different perspectives. And we need to have a social process to be involved in the planning and the engagement uh, to do it. Uh, well, okay, thanks, Frank, and I'll, for that, lots of money. <laughs> no, that's that that goes against what I said. 
No, the, the key thing is that I think both uh, MBON and GeoBON and Goose have generated good guidance that we can use in the GCRMN to move forward. So providing um, technical expertise, uh, links to people who can come in, come in and advise, develop, um, uh, build capacity, things like that. I think both MBON, um, MBON is actually an observing network as well, building up data collection on the ground um, and uh, through various research programs as well. And just so people know, I'm, I'm on the MBON group as well through, um, through GeoBON. So I think the key thing is not having two uh, global coral reef monitoring networks because that would just undermine um, the overall cohesiveness of being able to get this done. Um, but I see very much that there is a really strong role for the GCRMN structure and the international coral reef identity in terms of the societal benefits and having a very coherent institutional framework. What MBON and uh, Goose expertise and others can provide is, is really uh, the top talent that gets it done, the help in raising funds for specific exercises, not for the whole thing necessarily, but specific exercises and monitoring and data collection in regions. Um, and then also, you know, leading leading edge science in terms of developing new methods and approaches to to strengthen variables, to keep historical ones very consistent, but then to add new ones and new variables that, that are. You mentioned between yes. Geobon and Goose the difference in the so, so sense of what essential is yeah, and the UVs and the EBVs. The, and we started with um, uh, essential ocean uh, variable life coral, but you've mentioned that coral ecosystems are very complex and systems and, and there's also measures that involve fish and other life around the corals. What do you see as the next development and the readiness scale for the coral essential ocean variable? mentioned that coral ecosystems are very complex systems and there's also measures of fish and other life around the corals. What do you see as the next uh, development on the retina scale for the coral essential ocean variable? Um, well, for the coral essential ocean variable itself, um, I mean, the next uh, level is I think the, um, the operations, the, the middle part is, is firm and solidified now, and we don't need to do a lot of work on that. Um, the methods and so on. Uh, I think we do need to do more at the global level in terms of the um, the requirements, uh, why we're doing it, and, and also that can be with nuances for particular contexts, and then the data uh, and products at the end. And I think OBIS will, will come in to support that process, um, hopefully. Um, and then what we would do is is uh, basically develop a ideal template at the global level, but apply it at the regional level. And so with each of the regional reporting exercises is to use those as opportunities to engage the network members in understanding these readiness levels, uh, rating themselves to agree on where they are um, along those levels, and then taking the steps to strengthen them. Um, so I think that's, that's important for current variables. I think for the next set of variables under the EOVs, we've identified live coral cover. Um, there's a macroalgae EOV, and that can obviously apply to coral reefs with a few tweaks to include turf algae and things like that. And there's also a fish uh, population EOV that can be applied to coral reefs. Um, and so understanding how we deal under the EOV structure with a single variable such as fish biomass, uh, what does it mean when you collect it? Uh, focus on tuna in the pelagic system versus coral reef fish in a benthic system. So I think over the next two years, working on those two, I think, will be useful. And then there's a whole range of other... All right. Well, thank uh, you very much, David. We really appreciate the time you've uh, spent with us. And uh, me particularly, I really appreciate the, the systematic the approach you've taken and strengthening the GCR. Um, I will mention that our next case webinar is taking place next week, actually, next Thursday. So keep an eye on the email for that. It's going to focus on one of the oldest pieces of goose, the Ocean Observations Panel for Climate which actually even predates uh, the Global Ocean Observing System. So thank you very much. Thanks, David. And thanks to all the audience members who joined us.